Hello, and we are on week four, East meets West. All right, so we have spent a lot of time talking about the Americas and how the different nations, basically we have France in the north, New France, Canada. We have British on the East Coast, going Northwest, New England, Middle, Southern colonies. And then you have New Spain and Florida and throughout Mexico, down into South America. We have Portugal in what's now Brazil and everybody in the Caribbean. And they're taking advantages of the resources that are there. So that's where we are as far as the Americas. And that's still going on. So now we're going to focus on what's happening in Asia, which is where everyone wanted to get to in the first place. All right. So let's find out how that continues on. And of course, we're looking always for how do people prosper? Um, who gained during this time of colonization and exploration? And we also want to look at the other side of history. Who became disadvantaged during the time of colonization and this exploration? All right, so today we are going to look at the positive and negative impacts, if there were any of either, in Asia and Oceania. What type of colonies do we see in the Eastern Hemisphere versus in the Americas? Um, which European nations are going to stand out? How were colonies governed? Okay. And what was the result, if we were to summarize the result? So again, if we look at the resources that were coming out of the Americas, right, and the effects on people. So in the Spanish territory, we see that Catholicism is going to really spread, which it's still a major religion in that area, right? And in fact, if you go to Mexico, Spain is spoken, Spain, Spanish is spoken in Mexico for the very reason that the Spanish took it over, right? Um, in New England, in the British colonies, especially, right? We see um, they're known for fishing and fur, furs, fur trading and whaling, um, shipbuilding, because they're taking care of the resources or using the resources. We also see in the British colonies, Native Americans pushed away, all right? Uh, the Spanish are gonna use the Native Americans as slave labor and take advantage of it, where the English just have the attitude of get out of our way, all right? And then there's also, the English people have more an idea of, my religion is important to me and I matter, and they don't really care what your religion is. They didn't care about the religion of any native people because they really just wanted them to just go away. And then we have the French. And so the French making their livelihood from fish and furs, we see mostly trading post colonies in New France. Um, they're going to be more friendly with Native Americans. They're going to see them as partners. They're also going to send Catholic missionaries into the area. And so you're going to see Catholicism really take root. Um, much lower population in, in New France than in the British areas or New Spain. All right. And then we talked about the different regions within the British colonies. In New England, you see uh, very strictly held religions, Puritan, uh, separatists, people who were very... Uh, religion focused. In fact, the government was based on religion. And then in the middle colonies, we see more of a mix, different religions, uh, people that have a lot more tolerance would be another word that we use with the middle colonies. And then the southern colonies, we're definitely going to see it's the soil and the slavery, right? They sort of go together. All right, so if we look east to Asia, which again is where everyone was trying to get to in the first place, they never stopped wanting the trade goods. So silk, silk fabric, um, tea, porcelain, jewels, spices. People still wanted and were still buying this. It's just, I like to break it up into two different hemispheres that we study because otherwise it can get, I think it gets confusing. So we talked about joint stock companies. And we're going to talk about two of the biggest joint stock companies to, uh, when we talk about the East. We're going to talk about the East India Trading Company, which is the British East India Trading Company. And then we're also going to talk about the Dutch East India Trading Company. So 
this trademark here is the East India Trading Company. This is what would have been on those crates of tea that went into Boston Harbor during the American Revolution. All right, and so a viceroy. We see viceroys in the Spanish colonies and in the French colonies. A viceroy is probably a word you haven't heard of before, but if you think of, we use it often with vice principal or a vice president. And so if you think it's a vice to the royal leader, okay? Um, we also have the word vice, that vice is something that's bad, right? In this case, it's used to say more of an assistant. And I see how a typo there. They're not elected by the people. There's one too many E's in that. They are not part, okay? So Spanish and Portuguese colonies were the first to have viceroys. We're gonna see it in England and India. Other than that, we don't really see viceroys too much, um, but we do see the Spanish and Portuguese using viceroys. And if you were in Brazil, if you were in New Spain, they would have viceroys ruling there. And the French had a type of viceroy in what was New France. The British do not use this until later when we get to India. And so you would have a viceroy when India becomes a colony of England. So it is a, a word to be familiar with. All right, and again, where people pulled or pushed east to Asia. This is a big thing that we talked about when we talked about the Americas. Is this true for Asia? Is the same type of people going, are the same type of people going there? All right, so if we look at trade interest in Asia, you could just summarize the different nations and I'll give you this page. You don't have to have one this fancy, um, but we're going to look at everybody's trade interest in Asia. By everybody, I mean the major nations in Europe. All right, so we talk about the Asian colonies. You see that trade predominates, right? Trade, religion, and trade. So it's mostly about trade, which means money. So we ha you cannot talk about Asia or the Eastern Hemisphere without talking about the Treaty of Tordesillas. And Tordesillas is a place. And, um, and Tordesillas is where a treaty was signed between Catholic Spain and Catholic Portugal. Now, why do I say Catholic Spain and Catholic Portugal? Because the Catholic Pope, the head of the church, really asked that the two nations sit down and figure out what are they gonna do? They are both leaders in exploration. Right? So you have the Portuguese heading around Africa. They're the first to get to India. You have the Spanish heading west. They end up in the Americas and they're taking over uh, tremendous amounts of land in the Americas. And so because both these nations were Catholic nations, the Pope or the head of the Catholic Church was afraid that the nations would start to fight with each other over com competing for land and claiming lands. And so he said, hey, it's a big, beautiful world. Could we just divide it? And so at this point in 1494, so this is just two years after Columbus arrives in the Americas, they decide to split the world map in half. Um, it was a world map that they knew at that time. So it wasn't a world map like we would think of. And so the Treaty of Sordesias, you see that red line that got, cuts through South America. And this is why Brazil is Portuguese and the Portuguese stops. Why don't we see Portuguese explorers in the rest of the Americas? Because of this treaty. And why don't we see a lot of Spanish trading posts in Africa? It's because of this treaty. So what this treaty they agreed to is Spain would take the Western half. They could have any land they wanted to claim west of that red line that longitude line. And Portugal could take anything they wanted east of that line. And so that's why we really see the Portuguese and Spanish, their land claims very opposite of each other. It's because of this Treaty of Tordesillas. All right, so the cause to keep Catholic Portugal and Spain from competing for new land claims. Uh, and the effect is we're gonna see mostly Portuguese trading posts in Africa and Asia in the beginning, and Spain, Spain is going to claim land mostly in the Americas.
All right, so what are they getting in China? Well, one of the things they're getting is porcelain. And here's a, this um, plate and bowl are actually in uh, the Victorian Albert Museum in London, plate and bowl from 1725. And this flow blue or blue china was very valued. And in fact, it's why people say, I want to set the table with the good china, right? Oh, I have some china ware. We use it in everyday English. And it really is because people would say, oh, we're going to use the good stuff, the stuff from China. <gasps> you have plates from China. And it became a name for just plates, right? Porcelain plates that we use. Even though most of us probably don't have plates from China. Uh, my grandparents actually had quite a few of these items. And they were very valued. So this is a way to show people that you were wealthy. It was also a way to show that you were cultured because the designs and prints like you see on the 1725 one, you see two Chinese native people. You see some Chinese architecture, right? Um, a little bit about life in China. It uh, looks like, I can't quite tell what's in the background. But it was a way to show to your friends that you are a modern person and that you know about the world. So it was a, a way for wealthy people to not just spend money, but sort of to show off to their friends. And then it also became, in a way, artwork. All right, so this chart, and I'm, I'm gonna try to put this in with your primary sources. We talk about the value of spices a lot. And I did some digging and it wasn't easy, but I found a few charts, um, that show us what the price was. So pepper, all right, so here we have pepper at $18 a pound. And that seems like a lot, right? Think how lightweight pepper is. So I have, you know, a peppercorn grinder in my hand. But I want you to think about, I'm gonna give you a project this week and feel free to do it or not do it. Um, but I think it's a really interesting project and it takes a little bit of math um, to do it. But figure out how much you're paying these days. How much do people pay now for items like pepper and ginger and cinnamon, right? And so what you're going to do is you will take whatever pepper you have at home, or you can go to the grocery store and what you could do is just, um, or even do online shopping, right? You don't even have to leave your home and figure out how much would spices that you use in your household cost you per pound because this is just two and a half ounces, right? And I have a container of cinnamon. We just bought this last week, as a matter of fact, right? Two and a half ounces of, it's not even two and a half ounces of cinnamon and figure out how much does this cost per pound? And then look at what the average wage is. Um, so even if we just go by in America, the minimum wage and figure out how long would people have to work to make that? So on the top we have the price of spices per pound all right and this is in 1440 so this is before people get to asia this is really when it's coming in through the silk road and, and the breakdown of the silk road and then if you were a master mason or master carpenter so that means you were very skilled at your work you were making eight dollars a day all right in 1440 and so then you have to figure out how much of that money do you have? Um, so in cloves, all right, um, if we look at the bottom of the name of the spice and it can tell us um, in London, cinnamon, if we look in the London chart and we go down to the second row, that is the price of cinnamon. Um, and it tells us how much sterling per pound it would actually take 24 um, sterling pound per pound. Um, and Canadian money. And so depending on where you are or um, in Holland, so if we look at the dollars per pound and we just stick with that, if that's what you're using American pounds, but realize that the average wage per day would be $8 a day. So eight times five days of work, it's going to be $40 a week. Okay. Right. Eight times five is 40, um, which actually that's a really good wage. Okay, for that time in 1440, that would have been a very, very good wage um, for somebody working, uh, would be $8 a day. I, 
a master mason, a master carpenter is going to be very, very skilled. They're going to be at the top of their trade. But we can look at how much these spices are actually costing. And you can see how much profit you can make. When you figure a ship coming returning with tons of pepper and the value of that pepper, if you figure out what a ton weighs, and then you look at the cost of the pepper. So I'm going to give you a chart to see, and you can look at some comparisons to see the real value of spices. All right. So the Portuguese are going to start this off, right? They have Henry the Navigator who has combined everybody together. They have the best ships. They have the best maps. And so the best sailors. And so Vasco da Gama is the first one to actually arrive in India from Portugal. You can see this is 1498, All right, Still haven't made it to China or Japan yet. He's arrived in India. Okay. And so by 1505, the Portuguese have set up a small colony there and put a viceroy in. And so they, they consider an area of India to be a colony. It's not all of India like we think of today. So India in this time period was ruled by many princes. And so you would have a princedom. And so the Portuguese claim this area and most of what the Portuguese had going around Africa were trading posts. We don't see people from India moving. So even though there was a viceroy, a Portuguese viceroy in India in 1505, you don't see families moving there. It's not like New York City or Quebec or Montreal that are going to be these thriving, thriving cities. Um, this is going to be mostly men, trading posts, warehouses, uh, building harbors, having um, hotels for the sailors to take a break and get off the sea, having places that supply the ships with food and fresh water. And it's all going to be based on shipping and trade. All right, so this map lets us see how it took a long time for them to get around Africa. All right, and you see Vasco da Gama's route, and you see even along that eastern coast of Africa, he's making pit stops, right? He's making all these stops until he finally goes across the Indian Ocean and lands in um, Calcut, Calcut. So when Vasco da Gama returns to Portugal in 1499, um, this is a print. I think this is on, it's on a sardine can, I think this was, um, celebrating the Portuguese. And you can see he's being feted. He, there's a big, big parade. He's being carried into town. This was amazing. This was equal to the Americans having somebody walk on the moon. This would have been world news. This news is going to travel so fast across Europe. The Portuguese did it. The Portuguese got there. Oh, my goodness. And in Portugal, they're going to feel like they are the superpower. And in the 1500s, the Portuguese were. They are one of the wealthiest countries. And it's going to be from sugar plantations. And it's also going to be from trade with India. All right. So if we look at the green spots on this map, right? We can see how Portugal starts to have all of these trading posts and, and colonies. You can see in the western coast of Africa, we have Guinea. We have that lower western area that they're starting to colonize. And then on the east coast, <coughs> you also see it. And again, that's going to be because these are good resting places for their ships. These are good places for them to come in to refresh their food supplies to do any ship repairs that they need, to rest their crew for a little bit, and then be able to sail back out. And they're probably making some trades along the way also. There was gold and pepper that was coming out of Africa. There was rice that was coming out of parts of Africa. So they're going to get some trade goods from there also. And of course, the Portuguese are also going to be taking people out in a forced migration. All right? You see that all along the eastern coast of India, in Goa, in Ju, in Cochin, in Colombo, in Calcut, and we're going to see them uh, in the Malacca, in uh, what we would call East Timor, the Spice Islands, that Oceania area. 
They're going up into Macau in China, and we're going to see them in Nagasaki in Japan. And so over time, they're just going to keep spreading east. And that was the goal, right? That was the original goal that we first talked about was to get to Asia. All right. So the Portuguese, again, that Treaty of Tordesillas is what really changes it. And I think we would have seen a much heavier Spanish presence in the eastern part of the world had that treaty not been signed. Now, the treaty, though, was only between Spain and Portugal. England never signed the treaty. France never signed the treaty. The Netherlands or Holland never signed the treaty. And so they didn't care. They felt that they were in the game. And so they had no problems competing with Portugal for claiming lands and territories. And you can see on this map that it looks like a busy highway, right? The oceans are just full of trade routes and you would have had ships coming and going constantly. And so this is where the East India Trade Company was formed. And it was formed as, an, as a joint stock company. In fact, it's such a large company that they have their own security forces. And in India, they're going to hire local men um, called Sepoys. And we're going to talk about them later on in history as we get into the 1800s. And there's a major rebellion of the security force. All right. And so what is England taking out of India? Tea, jewels, spices silks. In fact, India is so profitable that they become known as the jewel in the British crown, right? And so India just has a wealth of products that people want. And England's not the only one in India. England's there. France is there. Portugal is there. The Dutch are there. You're definitely, you're going to see the Spanish try to get a foothold in, but it's really those other countries. It's going to be England, Portugal and France and Holland is going to be those four nations that we see have a really strong hold within uh, India. That sort of gets pulled in different directions, right? So the Dutch create the Dutch East India Trading Company. And the Dutch East India Trading Company goes on to be one of the most profitable companies um, really in history at that point. If we compare the money value in the 1600s to today, they probably still would be considered one of the most profitable companies. So they have a foothold in India, but where they really expand is in what we would call the Spice Islands, the Moluccas. Okay. Um, they're going to control the coffee trade. In fact, some another word for coffee is Java, J-A-V-A. -A, and that's because a lot of coffee came from the island or nation of Java. And so people would see the bags of coffee and it would have, you know, imported from Java on it. And they're like, oh, I want a cup of Java. And then sometimes people say it's Joe because Java ended up being sort of slanged into Joe. And so there's a lot of history with coffee. In fact, I think it's an interesting story. So the reason that we now have coffee in the Americas growing in South America and other areas is because the rumor has it that there was a governor, a Dutch governor, living in the Spice Islands. He had his family with him, which was very typical. Um, and his wife had a boyfriend and the husband finds out about the boyfriend. And he's a tradesman. And the husband bans him from the island. Now the Dutch had a law that no coffee plants could leave the island. Coffee beans could leave the island, but no coffee plants. And as a farewell gift to the governor's, the wife's boyfriend, the wife sends him a bouquet. And in that bouquet are some coffee plants that he cares for and takes with him westward and eventually they are brought to some islands in the Americas. So that is the rumor of how the coffee plant ended up growing in the Americas. I, I think it's an interesting thing, of, but this is what countries would do. The mother country would control trade. And one of the ways of controlling the trade was that the Dutch 
refused to let coffee plants leave the country. And that way no one else had could control the coffee trade. And it was the Dutch that controlled the coffee trade. Um, so the Dutch are going to have their own tea trade too. The East India Company is going to become very well known for um, tea from India. All right. So the Netherlands, we see this VOC. That is going to be the Dutch East India Trading Company. All right. Um, they can also control the Cape of Good Hope on the southern tip of Africa. And again, that's going to be a major trading post. It's going to develop into a country. It's going to develop into a major colony. In fact, um, the Dutch people who move there are actually going to create their own language known as Afrikaners, A-F-R-I-K, A-A, because, of course, the Hol Holland or the Netherlands is a very small country, and they're looking um, for farmland. And so we see a lot of farmers settling into the southern tip of what's now South Africa. And then later on in history, uh, they're going to get a fight with the British who want the land also. But at this time, um, in the late 1600s into the early 1700s, the Dutch are controlling the Cape of Good Hope. The Dutch are in South, what's now South Africa. They're controlling the spice trade. They are incredibly, incredibly wealthy. So by 1700, the Dutch surpassed the Portuguese. They are a wealthier nation than Portugal and wealthier than France. Right. So you cannot have all this trade without pirates and pirates were a very real thing. Um, always a threat. And so when you have these ships, this is again, why you're going to have these trading posts and why nations want to take certain areas of a coastline and develop that into their own trading posts. They're going to hire local people to guard. They're going to have major warehouses and security forces. And so you will have some families moving to this area, most often because a husband has been appointed as a governor or someone to monitor that area and they're going to bring their family. He's going to be very well paid. And these people will change position after a while. So you see a few families starting to move into it, but it's not where people are saying, I'm going to buy a ticket and I want to move there myself. Usually it's people moving there because of government or um, associated with the trade business, someone in shipping or trade. All right, so everyone's trading happily. And the Dutch arrive in Japan in 1609. Now the Portuguese have already been there. Okay. Um, and I think it's important to point out that the Dutch finally get to Japan after losing two ships to the Spanish. So again, it shows you there was competition. People are fighting with each other. There's these mini battles that erupt over in the oceans. And again, it goes back to why do you need joint stock companies? Um, there is so much competition and there's so much money to be made. All right. And so the Dutch start trading at Nagasaki. Nagasaki is one of Japan's islands. So the nation of Japan is really several islands, um, some so small that people don't live on them, more volcanic islands, uh, but you have some major islands. And so Nagasaki becomes the major trading post. Well, I thought that went for it. There we go. All right. Now France. Okay, so France is also coming into India. And with the blue color here, you see how France has New France, Canada, down the Mississippi River Valley, the area that's going to become the Louisiana Purchase. You see France having a pretty good amount of islands in the Caribbean, right? You have, um, there's French New Guinea on the top northern tip of South America. You, ha you see France has a pretty heavy presence on the west coast of Africa, they're going to continue that. As you go into the 1800s, you're going to see real colonies spread. In the beginning, again, it's mostly trading posts. All right. And then you see France also on the east coast of India. All right. So the nations are really trying to avoid each other. There's so much land to claim and so many resources to claim 
that most of them are pretty happy once they just get their foot on land and set up trading posts. But of course, everyone always wants more wealth, right? There's never enough wealth. So let's go back a little bit to the Portuguese arriving in Japan and they arrive in 1543. So they bring with them trade goods. Um, they bring clocks and eyeglasses, tobacco, firearms, and other things, what they think of as modern items. This would be modern technology. And what the Japanese were most interested in were the science items and consider eyeglasses to be science, right? And guns. So even though China invents gunpowder, it is the Europeans who invent a method to use gunpowder um, in because they have the Iron Age, they have steel industry, and so they develop guns. Now, the Japanese are more than happy to sell to the Portuguese. They just don't want to buy a lot from the Portuguese. All right. So along with the Portuguese, because again, Catholic nation, the Portuguese kings and queens, the monarchs are supporting these expeditions. They're going to send Catholic missionaries. Very famous Catholic missionary is Francis Xavier. He's a Jesuit, Jesuit priest, and the Jesuit priests were known for going to live among the people. This is mostly what France sends into the new France area, into Canada. All right, and he had been in Goa. And he introduces Christianity to the Japanese. He had been in India. He is brought over to Japan. He has a good relationship in India. And so as traders come, every time a trade ship comes in, you're getting more Catholic priests coming in, more Jesuits coming in. Uh, the Japanese actually call them Nanban um, because it calls them Southern Barbarians, which gives you an idea of how they valued the Portuguese. Um, the Portuguese are able to sell tin, lead, so again, metal work, right? Gold, silk, and I, I don't, I think it's more silk tapestries that they're bringing in than silk because silk is produced in China. Wool, so wool's going to be really a main export of Europe, okay? What are they buying from the Japanese? They're buying swords, um, Japanese knives and swords today are highly, highly valued for their um, craftsmanship. Lacquerware. Lacquerware are uh, certain, it's almost like an enamel pad, but it's a painting on plates and vases. All right. They're buying silk and silver. All right. 1612, Japan gets tired of the Christian Jesuits. They get tired of, they're worried that their culture is going to start to change. And they want to keep their culture. They really, remember, they call them barbarians. They don't want to be like the Portuguese. They are happy making money from the Portuguese. They're happy gaining science knowledge from trade items that are brought over. But they have no interest in changing their culture. So by 1641, the Portuguese are kicked out entirely. Um, in 1612, Christianity as a religion is banned, and no one in Japan is allowed to practice that faith. By 1641, Japan just wants the Portuguese out. Absolutely. So this is what is known as a policy of isolationism. All right, so different nations have isolationism. And when you study this term in history, it's a term that should bring up a few different countries and dates for you. So this is the first time we really see isolationism is with Japan. But there's also a time in history that we talk about isolationism with the United States. So when you see this term come up in history, it's important to look at the dates. And if it's in the 1600s, we're talking about Japan. We're talking about Asia. Right. So in China in 1661, so just 20 years after this ban in Japan of the Portuguese, you have the Qing Dynasty. 
And China sees itself as very advanced, just like the Japanese do. Uh, they have, as it says here, they have a history that goes back 2,000 years. And just like the Japanese, they also welcome the Jesuit priests. And Jesuit priests were very well educated. They have gone to college. So they welcome them not for their religion, but for their science and math knowledge. And China already had trade restrictions on all nations. They want to preserve their culture. They want to choose what they buy. They're glad to sell anything to anyone, but they're going to be choosy on what they buy. All right. So the Dutch are trading with China, as are the Spanish and the Portuguese. But the Dutch have a knack for trade. And they have a knack for understanding the people that they're buying from. Excellent, excellent business people. Okay. And so in China, part of the culture was you were to kowtow to the emperor. And kowtow means to bow, but not just to bow from a standing position, to get on your knees and then bow with your head completely down. All right. And at that time, you also bring gifts to the emperor. And you don't just kowtow once, you kowtow nine times. And this is very a form of high respect. And the Dutch are like, hey, if I've got to touch my head to a carpet nine times, but I'm going to make $9,000. I'm in for it. Not everybody else was as accepting of that. In fact, we'll find out that in England, they were very unaccepting of that. Um, and this is a primary resource from a letter that the Chinese emperor sends to King George III of Great Britain. In it, he says, there's nothing we lack, meaning there's nothing that China lacks as your principal envoy and others have themselves observed. So saying the man that you've sent to deal with me, he has seen for himself all the great things that China has and sees we have no need of any trident items from you. We have not set much store on strange or ingenious objects. In other words, your little trinkets, the little items that you bring us, we don't care about that. We can make those if we wanted to. Nor do we need any more of your country's manufacturers, meaning the manufactured goods that are going to be coming over. As England gets into the Industrial Age, Industrial Revolution starts in the late 1600s in England, they're making mass producing items. And they're like, we don't want it. We have no need for your little toy items. Um, in fact, in 1793, Lord McCartney refuses to kowtow to the Chinese emperor and presents him with a letter from the king. And the result is that England is kicked out of China. They have no use for it. So I'm hoping you're asking at this point, why? Why was China able to kick out whole nations? Why was Japan able to kick out whole nations, right? And it's because of their military. They have a central military. They have a central leader, a ruler, right? They have emperors. And those emperors can call forth an army. And it, unlike India, that has individual princes, unlike Africa, which has individual princes and kings in different areas, China and Japan not only have emperors and large militaries, they have the horses, they have armor, they have weapons. And so they are equal, not only in government strength, but in military strength. And it honestly, it's not worth the battle. It's not worth the battle to these European nations. And so the Dutch, who are more than willing to respect the Chinese emperor, right? They're buying all the porcelain that China has to sell. They're buying all the silk. And tea, tea is first coming in from China. And by the year 1800, tea is going to make up 80% of the shipments to Europe that um, the Dutch and the English have also. So 
tea is really going to explode in Europe in the 1600s. Before then, it wasn't something that they really knew about. Right. So why do they only have trading posts in Asia? Because, again, we're looking at who's benefiting and who's losing. So anyone involved in trade is gaining. Right. They only have trading posts because China and Japan are kicking them out. They have a policy of isolationism. They're not allowed into the nation. In fact, there are no foreign trading posts in China at all at this point. And Japan is only going to allow one trading post in Nagasaki, and only the Dutch are allowed at Nagasaki because the Dutch respect and the Dutch aren't trying to push a different culture onto the people. And so, honestly, people don't want to move there. There's not enough farmland. Um, there is so much land in the Americas, and the land is more similar to what they have in Europe. It's easier to take over the land. Uh, smallpox, which smallpox was already a disease in Asia. So they're not killing off extra people by accident with these European diseases um, and the military strength that people in Asia have. So this again explains why were Europeans able to do what they wanted to, to the people in Africa and the people in the Americas. It's because of military strength. It's not because people in the Americas or native people in Africa didn't resist. It comes down to military power and government power. And so because China and Japan had strong militaries and one central government, they could better resist. All right. Um, so here we see that note, those notes. Got a little bit ahead of myself. All right, so what do we see as a result in the 1600s, um, 1500s to uh, 1700s? All right, in India and the Spice Islands, we see Britain, France, Portugal, and the Netherlands having trading posts. Dutch are controlling the spice trade. And Dutch are also going to be controlling any of the trade coming out of China, Japan. So even though the Portuguese are the first to China and the Portuguese are the first to Japan, they're going to get kicked out. Britain's trading with China, but then they refuse to follow the customs and show respect to the emperor. So they get kicked out. The Dutch are like, yeah, cha-ching, we're in it. I'll kowtow for all that trade money. And so China develops a closed door policy of isolationism. And that term closed door is important because when we get into the early 1900s, late 1800s, we're going to see an opposite effect of an open door policy. So there are certain phrases in history we want to sort of think of as red flags. This closed door for China, right? C for China. China has a closed door policy, isolationism. Japan's going to do the same thing. In fact, Japan does this before China. Portuguese arrive, bring Christian missionaries. They're kicked out. The Dutch are the only allowed trade partner. In fact, it is against the law in Japan for a Japanese person to speak with a foreigner. Um, just to give you another story, an anecdotal story about this, I ha was listening to a podcast one day and there were some Japanese fishermen who got blown off course in a terrible storm. And they are rescued by some Americans. All right, so this is, we're into early 1800 at this point by some American sailors. And they are brought back to the island of Hawaii because even though they were in danger at sea and they're saved by this U.S. ship, they know if they return to Japan, they would be killed because they had spoken, to, they had allowed these foreigners to save them. And so they couldn't return home. So several of the men go to Hawaii and they stay there. One of the young men continues on with the captain of the ship and actually gets educated in America. He um, 
finds privileges in America he didn't have before, such as he's able to ride a horse. So another law in Japan was only samurai warriors or royal family members could ride horses. But this boy was very young when he was found. And so he has this desire to go back to Japan. He wants to see his mother. She, he knows she must be getting older and he wants to you know, let her know that he survived. So he's still in communication with these men in Hawaii. They go back to Hawaii. They get on a ship. They have a plan. And their plan is they're going to let the Americans take them so far off the coast of Japan. Then they're going to drop down in a small rowboat. They're going to come ashore. And they're hoping that they can sort of talk their way back onto the island. They're thinking maybe things will get better. Well, they're found and they're arrested. They're brought to prison because, again, they have been with foreigners. Here's the difference, though. At this point, the Japanese officials realize they have information about the outside world. They can tell the Japanese government what the Americans are doing. What is America? They can help them map who's where and which nations are where. And so they actually, their lives are saved because they have lived abroad for so long and they're bringing back so much information they want to know about the science. They want about which nations are powerful, how ships have changed. They bring back this information to the Japanese. And that's actually what saves their life is probably had they gone back when they were first rescued, they would have been killed. But this is also interesting because we need to study the culture of the Japanese people. Again, they're continuing to be interested in the world. They're continuing to want that science knowledge. And we're going to see this carry forth into the future. All right. So how did this trade with Asia impact Europeans? Well, things like cinnamon, like black pepper, become much more commonplace. Still have a high value, but at least more people are able to afford them. Porcelain or china becomes a way to show culture and wealth. In fact, any item from the east if you have a silk robe and it came from asia it's highly highly valued you also have growth of the middle class people so this is where trade is going to come in this is the idea of mercantilism where merchants are getting wealthy but that trade is still going to be controlled by the government all right in asia so certain people within asia are going to become wealthy Asian nations are going to increase their science knowledge, especially China and Japan. China has no interest whatsoever in buying anything from Europe. They have no interest. The only thing they have interest in, like Japan, are weapons and science. All right. And as a result of that, China and Japan develop isolation policies. But even though European nations are kicked out, it doesn't stop them wanting those goods. So China and Japan are still gaining wealth, even though they have this policy of isolationism because the Dutch are still trading. So what would happen is China would send trade ships to Nagasaki and then the Dutch were allowed at Nagasaki, but they were not allowed off the island of Nagasaki. And very few people were allowed to actually interact with the Dutch tradesmen. So people in Asia are benefiting there's going to be increase in wealth there. There's an increase in science knowledge. Europe is gaining and benefiting also. So it's basically a win-win. And again, it really goes back to the idea of why, right? It's because, especially in Japan and China, you have nations and people that are basically equal to Europeans as far as military strength and government strength. There are strong leaders in India, there are strong leaders in Africa, but they don't have the same military strength. And there's so many of them in a large area that each one just controls a small portion of the land. So we always want to think about what would you do in their shoes, right? And a lot of them, especially in India and Africa, it's better to do the trade because if you don't do the trade, with that European sea captain, 
if a Dutch sea captain comes into your harbor and offers to conduct trade with you and set up a trade contract, if you don't do it, he's going to go to the next harbor and trade with the prince down the road. And then that person's going to gain money and gain weapons from trade. So if you don't do it, your neighbor is going to do it. And then your neighbor will be more powerful than you. And so what we start to see in India, and we definitely see in Africa, is an unbalance. We start to see certain people gaining power and other people losing power within these nations. Where in China, Japan, the country pretty much stays the same. So it's all about how the government is set up and how that is balanced in the world. All right, so that takes us east to Asia, and that pretty much wraps that up. We will look at some primary sources. I don't have a lot of videos on this. There's just not a lot that's out there that's not as lengthy as this lesson is, which is very lengthy, all right? Um, and we just have to talk about the different areas. So India was a very different trade area than the Spice Islands, which is a very different trade area than Japan. Um, Japan and China are more similar in what they want and what they don't want from the Europeans. And again, it has to do with military strength. And can you resist the Europeans that are coming in with advanced weaponry, with armor, with guns and other weapons such as that? And that's what really determines who's going to be an equal trade partner. And we see that same effect in the Americas.